Thank you for joining the January Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Files Channel 962. Uh, it's also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. So uh, to um, begin the meeting, I will take a roll call of the board members. Uh, Ms. Downs. Present. Mr. Monahan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. And uh, I, the chair, is uh, I'm present. <laughs> okay, um, agenda item number one. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes from the December 17th, 2020 meeting. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Okay, Mr. Miller? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye, motion passes. Uh, agenda item number two. Um, excuse me, I'd like to recuse myself from this item. Uh, is it this one or the other one? The BP, we're on the EDIC. Oh. Okay. Thank you. I'm okay <laughs> with this one. You're okay with this one, okay. Um, request, uh, Right, so agenda item number two, request authorization to award a contract to Studio NE Incorporated to provide design drawings and construction administration services for the 12 Channel Street stair presentation project within the Raymond L. Uh, Flynn Marine Park in an amount not to exceed $180,000. Uh, William. Yes, thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, members of the board. My name is William Epperson, Deputy Director for Capital Construction within the Real Estate Department. I am before you today to request authorization to execute a design contract with Studio NA for the 12 Channel Street Stair Pressurization Project in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. This matter was last before you at the September 2020 board meeting to request authorization to solicit qualifications and fees for this work. 12 Channel Street is a nine-story masonry building originally constructed by the U.S. military in 1941 as a storehouse in the South Boston Naval Annex. It is currently a light industrial manufacturing building with several tenants. The building has five stairwells, three of which are egress towers serving all nine floors. With evolution of building and life safety codes, the stairwells require upgrades and improvements to bring them into conformance with the current code. The design work will include a stairwell pressurization system, which would keep the stairwells free of smoke in the events of a building fire, as well as other improvements to reach compliance with the life safety codes. Plans and specifications will be prepared in accordance with Chapter 149 of the Massachusetts General Laws. The contract will also include bid assistance, resident engineering services, and construction administration. The BPDA issued a formal request for qualifications in accordance with Chapter 7C of the Massachusetts General Laws on October 28th of 2020. The process included outreach to minority and women-owned firms, and a pre-submission conference was held with interested respondents. Two firms submitted qualifications in response to the solicitation on November 24th, 2020, and they were Studio NA and Silverman Trikowski Associates. A designer selection committee was assembled to review each submitting team's qualifications and their relevant experience. Based on that review and interviews with the respondents, the committee unanimously recommends the design contract be awarded to Studio NA. Studio NA is themselves a minority women-owned firm with previous experience in the building and extensive experience with similar building improvement projects. They have assembled a qualified team of subconsultant engineers that also includes other women-owned firms. The total contract award is for $180,000 and has been appropriately budgeted for in the agency's fiscal year 21 capital budget. Therefore, we are requesting that the director be authorized to enter into this contract with Studio NA. Thank you, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Monahan? Oh, sorry, mute. Yeah, yeah mute, Mike. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I thought I hit on mute, so aye. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Landsmark? 
Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, item number three, request authorization to enter into a lease agreement with Droplet Incorporated for the use of suite 602 at 12 Channel Street within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Suite, six to, suite 602 is a 4,500 square foot suite in 12 Channel Street in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. It is uh, air conditioned with two small offices. Uh, Droplet Inc. is a company formed in 2017 by two MIT uh, trained PhDs. Uh, the device is developed, they've developed a device for needle free delivery of non intravenous uh, medicine below the skin line. It's a very useful device to administer medicine for various skin diseases. Droplet intends to use the space for production, uh, packaging, distribution, and ancillary offices. We're proposing a one year lease with an additional one year option term. Uh, we're proposing a rate of $21.50 per square foot or uh, approximately $98,000 for the first year. Um, a BPDA market analysis recently conducted indicates that that rate is very consistent with the market for class B office um, and upper floor warehouse space in South Boston Seaport submarkets. Uh, we've reviewed Droplet's financial statements and they have more than sufficient resources to pay the proposed rent. We're requesting permission to enter into a one-year lease with an option to extend for an additional year at the then current market rate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number four, request authorization to extend the license agreement with Live Nation Worldwide Incorporated allowing continued temporary use for an outdoor hospitality space for a portion of 290 Northern Avenue within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park during the calendar year 2021. De Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Live Nation has been attended in Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park since 2004. Uh, the 5200 seat venue is used primarily for concerts, uh, but also school graduation ceremonies and other community uses. Uh, within the venue is a 5,000 square foot uh, structure which serves as their VIP access area, contains a full bar, tables and chairs and, and restrooms. Due to COVID related precautions, the entire 2020 concert season was canceled. Um, in June of 2020, BPDA authorized Live Nation to open the VIP area as a hospitality space open to the general public. Um, given the uncertainty of the 2021 concert season, staff is recommending that Live Nation be allowed to utilize the VIP area for hospitality open to the general public again in 2021. Um, the right to open for business, uh, we're proposing the right to open business for the uh, rest of the calendar year. However, the area will not be open to the general public uh, during any uh, ticketed performance at the venue, which we certainly hope happens um, this summer. Um, the proposed use is consistent with state regulations that govern the use of the pavilion. No base fee is proposed for the expanded use. However, Live Nation will pay to BPDA 12.5% of all gross receipts received for the days when the area is open um, on non-concert nights. That fee is consistent with the rates received by BPDA for other outside beer garden type venues, Harpoon for, uh, in particular, as well as the rates paid by similar competing outdoor venues throughout the seaport. So we're requesting permission to enter into a one year uh, license amendment with Live Nation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes, thank you. Thank you. Item number five, request authorization to amend the license agreement with Suffolk Construction for use as, co as a COVID testing site of a portion of lot C-1 within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park to extend the term for an additional two months until March 31st, 2021. Uh, John. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I'd like to preface this presentation uh, that the, the description I'm about to give will also uh, hold true for a later agenda item uh, of a similar action. 
Uh, on December 22nd of last year, a joint announcement was made by Mayor Walsh in coordination with Partners in Health, Harbor Health Services, and the Greater Boston Building Trades to declare private testing sites for those workers in the trades at construction sites throughout the city. These testing sites are sponsored by separate general contractors that employ a large number of these workers at various construction sites. The parcel recommended is the C1 lot in the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Industrial Park. Given the large cluster of construction between the Marine Park, Seaport, and surrounding areas, the unused lots typically used for cruise ship parking provides a central testing site for many of the workers. This testing site specifically is sponsored by Suffolk Construction. On July 16th of 2020, uh, the board here authorized the BPDA to enter into 30-day licenses in support of COVID relief efforts. Uh, accordingly, under such authorization, there is currently an existing 30-day license for this location. This existing license commenced on January 4th and expires of 2021 and expires on January 25th of 2021. Uh, upon approval today, the proposed amendment will extend the expiration date to March 31st, 2021. Staff therefore recommends that the director be authorized to amend the existing license for the purposes of establishing a centralized COVID-19 testing facility for construction industry employees working at construction sites within the area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the board? Do we think that um, that March date will be sufficient? No, the March date was used because we have a number of things ending on that March, and then we will, it will most likely have to come back to the board for another extension. Um, but the hope is, too, that uh, in April, depending on cruise ship season, if it is to come back, we want to make sure we differentiate between cruise ship gets the priority, so we'd have to relocate this testing site. Um, so we just made it to March 31st, knowing that, yeah, in a short time, we'll probably have to come back. Okay. Um, any further questions? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Mm -hmm. All vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number six, request authorization uh, to advertise and issue a request for proposals for the 2021 trolley stop program within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park during the 2021 cruise ship season. Laura. Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to join you virtually this afternoon. My colleague John Fitz has really teed me up by talking about uh, the cruises that uh, we may be anticipating this year. I'm here to request your authorization to advertise an issue a request for proposals for a trolley stop program within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park. The Marine Park essentially surrounds the Flynn Cruise Terminal, which typically accommodates around 150 vessels and 400,000 passengers from 20 different international cruise lines. Uh, we found that licensing a trolley stop on BPDA property close to that terminal allows um, the participating trolley tour companies to serve the visitors who come in through the port of call cruise, uh, cruise ship schedule. Um, although licenses are not subject to uh, Mass General Law Chapter 30B, the BPDA nonetheless seeks to issue a request for proposals so that we can ensure the broadest participation possible in this program. We're also going to use the RFP process to build in flexibility so that we can address the serious impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Both the term and the fee associated with the license will be subject to adjustment or renegotiation as deemed necessary by the BPDA. Up to three licenses will be granted to the qualified respondent or respondents who submit the most advantageous proposals. The awarded licenses will be for the 2021 cruise ship season, whatever that may be, <laughs> with two extension options. Due to the unknown pace of the 2021 economic recovery, the minimum license fee specified in the RFP will be $10,000, which is approximately a 75% reduction from the fee that we had in place prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. I also want to note that I'll be requesting similar authorization for a trolley program in the downtown waterfront during the BRA portion of today's meeting. And with that, thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Laura. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. 
Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number seven, uh, personnel. David. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, David Peer, Director of Human Resources. Um, I have several items on the EDIC agenda with details in your board memos. We have uh, four, um, I mean, three appointments. Sarah Michaud, a development and fundraising administrator in the Office of Workforce Development with the start date of January 19th. Ahmad Hamsa, a language access coordinator in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion with the start date of February 1st and Anna Callahan, a planner two in the planning department with the start date of February 1st. We also have four employment service contracts, Hugo Solis in the general counsel's office with the start date of January 18th, Ryan Frania in the compliance department with the start date of January 4th, Katiana Angleg Anglade um, Ogbulika in the office of workforce development with the start date of January 19th, and Ophelia Adige Awuha in the Office of Workforce Development with the start date of January 19. And finally, we have one status change um, with Linda Kwan, um, Deputy Controller in Budget and Finance. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, and that was the final item on the EDIC agenda, so I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. I move we adjourn the EDIC meeting. Second. Call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Lundmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. Okay, we'll now start the BPDA portion of the meeting. Thank you for joining the January Boston Redevelopment Authority Board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 pandemic. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the Boston, the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Bios <laughs> Channel 962. It's also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. So to begin uh, this meeting, I will take a roll call. Um, so, Ms. Downs. Present. Uh, Mr. Monaghan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Okay, Mr. Miller. Present. Okay, and I, uh, Priscilla Rojas, the chair, is present. Am present. Am present. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to go over agenda item number two. Um, yes, I wish to uh, recuse myself uh, from the item. Please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. So agenda item number two, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on February 11th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the application of the Old Colony 4 Taxable Limited Partnership and Old Colony 4 Bonds Limited Partnership and Old Colony 5 Taxable Limited Partnership and Old Colony 5 Bonds Limited Partnership Chapter 121A project in the South Boston neighborhood. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number three, Board of Appeal. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Jeff Hampton, Senior Zoning Planner at the BPDA and the Planning Department. 89 petitions have been presented to you for transmittal to the Board of Appeal. Uh, this will cover five of their meetings, three of them in the month of January and two in February. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. 
Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number four, request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for a downtown waterfront trolley kiosk program for the 2021 tourist season. Um, Laura. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present to you again this afternoon. I'm requesting your authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for our downtown waterfront trolley kiosk program. The downtown waterfront, as we know, is a popular tourist destination and a value, valued location for trolley tour businesses. There are three trolley kiosk locations available on BPDA-owned land between Long and Central Wharves. As I mentioned during the EDIC portion of the board meeting, although we're not required to do so under state law, we want to issue a request for proposals to ensure the broadest participation possible. Again, we'll also use the RFP process to build in flexibility to address the serious impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Both the term and the fee associated with the license will be subject to adjustment or renegotiation as deemed necessary by the BPDA. Up to three licenses will be granted to the qualified respondent or respondents submitting the most advantageous proposals. The awarded licenses will be for the 2021 tourist season with two extension options. Due to the unknown pace of the 2021 economic recovery, the minimum license fee specified in the RFP will be $37,000, which as I stated for the EDIC program is a 75% reduction of the fee prior to COVID-19. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Lampmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number five, request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for a downtown waterfront merchandise kiosk program for the 2021 tourist season. Laura. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to present another program on the downtown waterfront. I'm requesting your authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for merchandise vendor kiosks within the downtown waterfront. This complements the trolley kiosk locations mentioned in my previous presentation. Uh, the merchandise vendor kiosk program creates opportunities for the selected vendor to sell merchandise to the public, which increases the number of people who use and activate the waterfront. Um, the program includes two kiosks operated by a single vendor. Most recently, this was the company TNTs, and they sold various Boston themed shirts, sweatshirts, hats, and other apparels, uh, apparel and collectibles. As with the trolley program, we will seek to use the RFP process to ensure both broad participation and maximum flexibility. One license for two locations will be granted for the 2021 tourist season with two extension options and a reduced minimum license fee of $33,000. Thank you again for your consideration and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Laura. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Laura. Item number six, request authorization to advertise and issue a request for proposals for the redevelopment of the Crescent parcel in the Nubian Square area of Roxbury. Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are requesting authorization to issue a request for proposals for the Crescent Parcel located at the corner of Melnia Cass Boulevard and Tremont Street in Nubian Square. This RFP is a part of the Plan Nubian Square planning area and is a collaborative effort between the BPDA, the Department of Neighborhood Development, and the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, or MassDOT. The Crescent Parcel has been vacant since the displacement caused by the highway takings of the 1960s and we are excited to issue this RFP to promote economic development and open space for today's community. The Crescent parcel is approximately 73,000 square feet and is composed of eight parcels of vacant land owned by the BPDA, MassDOT, and the city of Boston. Prior to final designation, the BPDA will acquire rights in the parcels owned by MassDOT and the city in order to convey the Crescent parcel through a long-term ground lease. 
The property is located in not one, but two urban renewal areas, the Campus High School and South End. The RFP has undergone extensive community process as part of Plan Nubian Square. Launched in February 2016, Plan Nubian Square builds on and updates the framework for development in the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan and guides the RFPs for nine publicly owned vacant properties in Nubian Square. Community members shaped the development guidelines included in every Plan Nubian Square RFP through the 30 public meetings that have been held to date. These guidelines include consistency with area planning history, economic development, affordable housing, sustainable and resilient development, good jobs, diversity and inclusion, and development without displacement. The BPDA held five public meetings to draft and revise the Crescent Parcel RFP between October 2019 and October 2020. Over this year-long community process, we received strong feedback from community members, particularly relating to the need to preserve trees and open space, respecting the needs of the residential neighborhood abutting the Crescent Parcel to the south, and ensuring that the development creates connections between Tremont Street and the Nubian Square neighborhood. The design guidelines for the final RFP reflect these values and desires. Proposals will be required to protect the existing trees and mitigate loss of mature urban canopy to the greatest extent possible, create publicly accessible open space at the corner of Melnia Cass Boulevard and Tremont Street, thoughtfully design building heights, recognizing the scale of the adjacent developments with taller heights located closest to Tremont Street and the low scale Madison Park housing site, and realize the potential for placemaking at the corners of Ruggles and Tremont, as well as Melnia Cass and Tremont, emphasizing these locations as gateways to Nubian Square. We look forward to issuing this RFP and bringing this long vacant site back into use for the community. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Morgan. Request authorization to amend the contract with Nelson Nygaard Consulting Associates Incorporated for the Plan South Boston Dorchester Avenue transportation plan, increasing the amount not to exceed $50,000 and to extend the term of the contract for four months. Jim. Secretary, uh, members of the board, uh, Secretary Paul Hemis, Director Golden. Um, since the fall of, of 2019, uh, BPDA staff has been working successfully with our consultant uh, team led by Nelson Nygaard. Um, this is a, a very important recommendation coming out of the original plan, South Boston, Dorchester Avenue work, uh, was to engage in a comprehensive transportation planning analysis uh, in conjunction with the community uh, to develop and recommend uh, short and long-term uh, transportation network improvements. Um, we have been a little bit delayed due to COVID-19 and has delayed our engagement, um, but we're at the point now where we're getting close to uh, developing our final recommendations and our final uh, transportation uh, plan document. We're hoping to complete that work uh, in the spring of this year, and this additional resources and time uh, will allow us to successfully complete that work. Uh, I'm available for any additional questions or uh, comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Jim. Item number eight, request authorization to amend the contract for environmental and building demolition engineering design services related to building 108 with Weston and Samson Engineers Incorporated to include funding for construction administration and resident engineering services by increasing the contract value by an amount not to exceed $680,275. William. Yes, thank you again, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm here to request authorization to amend the existing contract with Weston and Sampson Engineers, the design and engineer of record for the Building 108 demolition project in the Charlestown Navy Yard. The Building 108 project was before you last month requesting authorization to award the resulting construction project. 
This associated design contract needs to be amended in two parts. First, to amend the scope of work to include construction administration, resident engineering, environmental testing, and regulatory coordination. Second, to increase the contract amount by $680,275. It is crucial to the project's success to maintain continuity in the engineer of record, and for that engineer to inspect and provide oversight of the work being completed by the contractor. Further, given the environmental conditions of the building being demolished and the continued need for coordination with both the state DEP as well as the federal EPA, it is critical that Weston and Sampson continue in their capacity as engineer of record. The initial design contract stated the fees for this portion of the scope, the construction administration and the resident engineering would be negotiated once a general contractor had been selected and the complete scope of work uh, that was to be administered was known, thus the need for this amendment. The amendment will increase the contract by $680,275, bringing the total contract amount to $1,071,075. Both amounts are not to exceed amounts and subject to hourly billing for actual work performed. This work has been appropriately budgeted for in the agency's fiscal year 21 capital budget, and therefore we are requesting that the director be authorized to amend the contract with Weston and Sampson as described. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number nine, don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Request authorization to execute a construction contract with Heritage Restoration Incorporated for the purposes of waterproofing and structural reinforcement at the China Trade Building located at 2 Boylston Street in an amount not to exceed $599,150 uh, to execute any change orders that may be required and to enter into uh, an area way agreement with the city of Boston public improvement commission for said China trade building project, William. Yes. Thank you. So we are requesting authorization to execute a construction contract with heritage restoration for the basement waterproofing project at the China trade building located at two Boylston street in Boston's Chinatown neighborhood. This matter was last before you at the October 2020 board meeting to request authorization to advertise the public bid for this work. As you may recall, the building requires waterproofing in the basement area way as well as replacement of the hollow sidewalk above in order to make the space ready for a tenant fit out by Fenway Community Health Center, who has been authorized to lease the space as a health facility. As authorized by the board on June 11th of 2020, Bargman Hendry Plus Archetype, the architect for the project, has prepared construction bid documents for the waterproofing and sidewalk replacement in compliance with Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 149. The subject work includes replacing the existing sidewalk slab along Washington Street, reinforcing structural elements supporting the vaulted sidewalk in the basement, installation of a below grade drainage system, negative side waterproofing, and measures to mitigate construction impacts on the current building tenants. The board authorization for building the project was received in October of 2020, and the project was competitively bid in November of 2020 in accordance with Chapter 149 of the Massachusetts General Laws. Filed sub bids were received on November 24th of this year, followed by general bids on December 4th, both opened and read aloud. And the lowest eligible and responsible bidder was Heritage Restoration uh, for an amount of $599,150. All documents required by Chapter 149 and the invitation to the bids were properly submitted by the contractor. The architect of record who produced the bid documents has reviewed and uh, recommends award to Heritage Restoration as the lowest eligible and qualified bidder. The total contract award would be for $599,150 and has been appropriately budgeted for in the agency's fiscal year 21 capital budget. Therefore, we requested the director be authorized to enter into this contract with heritage restoration. And if approved, the work is expected to begin as early as February of this year with completion due before summer. Uh, in addition, uh, we are requesting that the director be authorized to enter into an area way agreement with the city of Boston's Public Improvement Commission. This is a standard agreement. Uh, it's required because the building's uh, basement extends beyond the property line and underneath the public sidewalk that is being replaced. In these circumstances, an agreement is required with the city detailing the maintenance and ownership of the sidewalk. Uh, the agency entered into a similar agreement in 2016 for the Boylston Street side uh, of the property. 
Um, so thank you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Okay, great. Do we have any questions from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, William. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You too. Item number 10, request authorization to amend the license agreement with Blue Man Boston LP to extend the term expiration date for use of the 84 through 86 Charles Street and the adjacent parcel on Warrington Street. Lauren. Madam Chairwoman, uh, thank you. Since 1995, the Boston Redevelopment Authority has licensed approximately 5,693 square feet of land located at 84 to 86 Charles Street and adjacent to the Charles Playhouse on Warrington Street to Blue Man Group LP. The current license agreement with Blue Man Group was executed in 2016 and is scheduled to expire January 26, 2021. Blue Man Group has been unable to pay rent to the BPDA since April 2020. However, due to their impending license expiration, Blue Man Group was ineligible to apply for the deferment program. Blue Man Group was further restricted from meaningful dialogue with the BPDA regarding terms and conditions of a license extension pending finalization of the Cirque de Soleil bankruptcy. Cirque de Soleil has since emerged from bankruptcy and has been acquired by Catalyst Capital, an international investment company, and the former operation, operator of MGM Resorts. Staff is pleased to report that local management of Blue Man Group has recently informed us that they are now authorized to commence negotiations toward a license amendment. It is the intention to negotiate and amend the restated license for future BPDA board consideration that applies the spirit and policies of the rent deferment program to the proposed payment schedule, taking into consideration revenue lost by Blue Man Group due to the required performance closures forecasted 2021 recovery timeline of the entertainment economy and rent delayed or foregone to the BPDA in addition to current and forecasted market value of the land at Bay Village and theater district neighborhoods. Therefore, staff recommends that the expiration date of the license between Blue Man Group dated September 13th, 2016 be extended to April 30th, 2021 to allow BPDA and Blue Man to negotiate terms and conditions of amended and restated license for future consideration for the board. Okay. Uh, thank you. Do, do we have any questions from the board? All right. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 11, request authorization to amend the license agreement with Jenny's Pizza for the use of approximately 800 square feet of land on a portion of parcel R-12B in the Arlstown Urban Renewal Area located at uh, 324 Medford Street in Charlestown to extend the term until March 31st, 2021. Lauren. Thank you again, Madam Chairwoman. Jenny's Pizza is a popular Charlestown pizza and sandwich shop. The BPDA board has previously authorized a license with Jenny's Pizza for the use of par this parcel for parking, but that license has since lapsed. The parcel has been made available for community and business parking for several years at no cost and primarily, though not exclusively, utilized by Jenny's Pizza. The use has always been on a first come, first serve basis. BPDA staff recently approached Jenny's Pizza to propose the use of the parcel to allow Jenny's exclusive use of the parcel during business hours to ensure that sufficient parking is available to support delivery demand, and two, to allow for supplemental insurance coverage to reflect the commercial use of the parcel during specific hours. The one year license term will commence on February 1st, 2021 and expire on January 30th, 2022. The license will renew annually for one year unless otherwise terminated in writing by either party within 90 days of the expiration of the then current term. The monthly fee for the initial one year term will be $220 per month, 110 per parking space. That rate will increase annually 
annually by 5% for so long as the license remains in effect. Jenny's Pizza will maintain comprehensive public liability insurance, auto and property damage insurance, and mounts consistent with industry standards and with the BPDA named as additional insured. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Do we have any questions from the board? I just want to say I'm really happy this parcel is being used to sell pizza. <laughs> I'm excited. I live on the other side of town, but I'm going to go over and get some. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, and also I, I am very, do want to commend the, uh, the new format of the uh, term sheets and, and things that are in the board packet that is very helpful um, to uh, be able to, to digest and review everything. So, so thank you to your team. Thank you. Okay. Would you comment on, on the uh, projected impact uh, on neighbors who may have been using uh, that site? Uh, sure. Uh, for the most part, this is just for hours, uh, business hours. Um, so after hours, parking will still be available. Um, I would say available, but it's generally first come, first serve to get these spaces anyways. Nothing will really change. Great. Um, any further questions? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Item number 12, request authorization to amend the license agreement with the John Moriarty and Associates Incorporated for the temporary use of a portion of parcel P-15B-1 in the Charlestown Urban Renewal Area. Uh, also known as Bunker Hill Community College parking lot one to extend the term until March 31st, 2021. John. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Under the same description uh, of my previous presentation regarding COVID testing sites for construction industry employees, uh, the site we now focus on is known as lot one of the Bunker Hill Community College parking lot. Uh, it will provide COVID testing service for the many construction sites in the North Station, Assembly Square, and nearby downtown areas. This site is specifically sponsored by Moriarty and Associates. Uh, as is the case previously, there is an existing 30-day license that ends on January 25th. Uh, upon approval today, the proposed amendment will extend the expiration date to March 31st, 2021. Staff recommends that the director be authorized to amend the existing license for the purposes of establishing a centralized COVID-19 testing facility for construction industry employees working at construction sites within the area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 13, request authorization to extend the license agreement with the Anthem Group Incorporated for the use of Shipyard Park in the Charlestown Navy Yard for activation purposes. John. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, in response to the 2018 RFP for activation of one of, of the Charlestown Navy Yard, Anthem was awarded the bid by this board uh, in March of 2019 for a one-year license. In February of 2020, the board authorized the director to enter into a second one-year license agreement with Anthem for a term that ran from June 2020 through January 1, 2021. This license allowed Anthem to run an outdoor amenity that produced revenue to support activation that was free and open to the public in the Charlestown Navy Yard. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Anthem's operations were impacted from a delayed opening, limited capacity, and limitations on activation activities. However, once open, the anchor was able to provide a safe and successful year that totaled approximately $58,000 worth of free activation. Uh, some of the highlights included live performances, wellness and fitness classes, a winter wonderland, and a variety of do-it-yourself activities. Uh, given the success and popularity of Anthem's activation over the past two years, and with the shortened and restricted season of this last uh, season due to the pandemic, uh, BPDA staff recommends extending the existing license under the same previous terms for calendar year 2021. 
Activation activities will return as soon as March 31st, 2021, hopefully, uh, and run through the end of the calendar year. Thank you. Great. Do we have any questions from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Item number 14, request authorization to extend the tentative designation of Madison Tropical LLC as the redeveloper of a portion of Parcel 10 of the Southwest Corridor Development Plan, known as Parcel B and to extend the temporary license agreement for Tropical Food International Incorporated's continued use of parcel 10B for parking. Dana. Madam Chair, members of the board, Secretary Fulhemus and Director Golden, I'm Dana Whiteside, Deputy Director for Economic Development with the agency. We're pleased to share with you this request for consideration of the extension of the tentative designation for Madison Tropical as developer of parcel 10 in Roxbury. As part of this request, a brief update about the status of the overall Madison Tropical development key items completed and upcoming milestones. Particular focus for today's action is the work which the development team has undertaken to advance the third and final phase of the overall Parcel 10 development. By way of reminder, the development team submitted a notice of project change for the 2085 Washington Street component of the project, transitioning it from a mixed-use office commercial development to a predominantly residential project. Madison CDC has engaged Trinity Financial to create a new proposed program which consists of approximately 114 residential units with a mix of rental and home ownership, both of which will be predominantly income restricted at middle income AMI levels. Approximately 107 parking spaces and also amenity space at the street level. Since the last time the tenant designation was extended, activities undertaken by the development team to advance the project have included the following. Submission in November of 2020 of a notice of project change supplemental filing containing additional and relevant environmental and impact studies. Submission in December of 2020 of a MEPA notice of project change filing with the Commonwealth's Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. Initiation of design review with the Boston Civic Design Commission, as well as the submission of applications through the city's Department of Neighborhood Development as well as the Commonwealth's Department of Housing and Community Development to support the affordable housing component of the overall project. In addition, the development team has continued to work with the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee in providing previews and updates accordingly, and has worked with local elected officials, uh, neighborhood organizations, and business owners to preview the elements of the project. During the period of the upcoming proposed designation extension, anticipated activities include follow-up on BCD, BCDC, Civic Design Commission review, initiating work with the city's Landmarks Commission to ensure compliance with preservation aspects that are associated with this portion of Nubian Square District, finalization of MEPA review, ongoing outreach and engagement with the Project Review Committee of the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan, as well as coordination with the Public Works Department for elements that are related to, related to ongoing infrastructure and public realm and also it is anticipated within this time frame that we will come back with a article 80 approval for this notice of project change and also request for consideration of final designation staff and community stakeholders are in agreement that progress to date by the development team is appropriate and moving in in, an, in the right direction given the complexity of this development and thus would recommend that an extension be considered this concludes my remarks and i'm happy to take any questions you might have as I close my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Bob Pizzini, Vice President of Real Estate with Madison CDC, who's also on hand to answer any questions if you'd like. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dana. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, great presentation. Uh, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. All right, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, item number 15, we have a certificate of completion. Request authorization to issue a certificate of completion to All Saints Development, LLC, for the 200 
to 204 Old Colony Avenue Project in South Boston. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number 16, request authorization to issue a determination waiving further review pursuant to section 80A-6 of the Boston Zoning Code, approving the notice of project change for building two within the planned development area number 122, 139 through 149 Washington Street, Brighton, by increasing the residential condo units from 48 to 55 units, including one additional IDP unit with 55 parking spaces and to take all related actions. Lance. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Director, uh, Director Golden and uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, the project has, a, a, for the record, 143 Washington Street, also known as 139-149 Washington Street. Uh, the project as approved by the BPDA board on March 14th, 2019, consisted of two new construction residential multifamily buildings totaling 228 dwelling units. Building one, which comprised 180 rental apartments, including 27 IDP units, where off-street parking and amenity space um, are included as part of the following proposed MPC. Uh, building number two, as approved, consisted of 48 home ownership units with a mix of one, twos, and threes, um, with one-to-one -one parking. Of the 48 home ownership units in building two, seven were designated as, as IDP units. New Boston Ventures, the proponent, is requesting an amendment solely to building two with respect to its regulatory entitlements with the intent of enhancing the project's organizational program and public benefits. I will just speak to one of the highlights and then Jonathan Garland, the project architect, will, will speak to the rest visually. Um, um, we're requesting to increase the total number of home ownership units from 48 to 55, um, a unit mix of 18 one bedrooms, 29 two bedrooms, and eight three bedrooms. Uh, both development teams, Avalon Bay Communities and New Boston Ventures um, regarding building one and building two will continue to work with BPDA staff to demonstrate compliance to Article 37. That concludes my presentation, and Jonathan Garland will take it from here. Thank you, Lance. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, pr please proceed to the next slide. So here uh, we're proposing, as Lance mentioned, 55 home ownership units, eight of which are affordable. Uh, 140 construction jobs will be uh, made, created through this project. Uh, we are in very close proximity to Fidelis Way Park in Monastery Path, and we're also targeting a LEED cer uh, Silver Certifiable Building. Next slide, please. Here's the site plan. You can see Building 2 at the top of the page. Again, it's uh, slated as a 55-unit homeownership building. Uh, south of that is the uh, Building uh, 1, which is not part of this uh, uh, Notice of Project Change, and then south of that is Washington Street. Next slide. Some of the key program features include the following seven items. Uh, increase in the number of home ownership units. Uh, we're targeting family style units from 48 to 55, while also maintaining the original BPDA approved building footprint. Increase in the number of affordable units from seven to eight, while maintaining a 15% affordable commitment, which exceeds the city's IDP requirements. Uh, the building will be designed to accommodate families and long-term residency with 70% of the units as two and three bedroom. We're maintaining a parking ratio of one space per dwelling unit for a total of 55 parking spaces, which also meets the requirements of the PDA. Uh, we're looking at an increase in the extent of outdoor open space, both private and for common use. We're enhancing the sidewalk and pedestrian connections to neighbors and all other dimensional criteria has been met, including uh, setbacks, height, and FAR with respect to the PDA. Next slide, please. 
Here is the ground floor plan. What you see in the yellow is the entrance lobby and residential amenity space. The gray is uh, enclosed garage parking, and then the site uh, perimeter around, around the, uh, the building. Next slide. Uh, this is the, uh, the main entry view as you would see the building upon approach, um, and it's the southeast uh, exterior perspective view. Next slide. This is just more of a close-up of the residential entrance. Next slide. This is the southwest corner of the building. Next slide. This is the northwest corner of the building. Next slide in the northeast uh, corner of the building. Next slide. So that concludes our presentation and we'd be uh, happy, to answer, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the board? Yeah, I, I have one. It looks like you increased the outdoor space and increased the number of units. Did you go higher or where did the extra space come from? So we, we have kept the uh, ground floor footprint of the building and have taken that and brought that up uh, across the other floors of the building. Um, and so that's how we were able to achieve uh, the additional units. In addition, we've uh, really just uh, increased the amount of efficiency of the building inside internally within the building to create those additional units. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions from the board? Right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 17, request authorization to issue a preliminary adequacy determination waiving the requirement of further review pursuant to section 80B-5.4C4 uh, of the zoning code for the redevelopment of a mixed use building consisting of 151 residential rental units, including 25 IDP units of which eight, eight will be the artist, will be artist live work units, uh, 1200 square feet of ground floor artist work room space, and 102 condominium units, including 14 IDP units and 160 garage parking spaces located at 1515 Commonwealth Avenue and to take all related actions. Now this board action um, for the 1515 Commonwealth Avenue project in Brighton was scheduled to be held on December 17th, 2020. And the board voted to table the proposed actions for further consideration. At this time, I move to take from the table the proposed actions for consideration. I have a second. Second. Okay, uh, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Dr. Landsmark? Oh, I need them off aye. one eye. Okay, Mr. Miller? Aye. All right, the chair votes aye, motion passes. Um, and we can now begin the presentation. Michael. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden, Michael Sinatra, Senior Project Manager, Development Review. The project before you is 1515 Commonwealth Avenue in Brighton. The existing site is a 2.2 acre parcel with a, a lot of approximately 92,275 square feet. The former use was an old hospital. The proposal is for two buildings with two, 253 total units, of which 102 will be home ownership and 151 will be rental. The gross square footage is approximately 245,000 square feet, and the buildings will be fluctuate between six to eight stories in height, or roughly 60 to 90 feet. The proposed project will also include 160 parking spaces and 34,000 square feet of open space. The IDP commitment will be as follows. 14% of the condos will be uh, will fall under the IDP policy or uh, 14 units and 17% on the rentals, which comes out to 25 units, some of which will be artist live workspace. The proponent will also be making a $600,000 payment to Alston Brighton CDC to help with the 6 Quint Street project in order to achieve greater affordability as part of the project. 
Lastly, the project will create 260 construction jobs and the total development cost will be $140 million. At this time, I would like to turn it over to the development team to run through their presentation in more detail, after which we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and good evening, all. Uh, my name is Stephen Davis. I am uh, representative of the Davis Companies, um, the component of this project. Um, we're going to go through this presentation very quickly this evening, understanding that there's a, a full agenda for the board. Uh, with that, next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, uh, there are 253 units in the project. Um, uh, uh, I'll leave up on the screen for the infographic for your uh, consideration. Um, 266, 260 jobs, excuse me, construction jobs created, uh, eight artist uh, housing units with affiliated uh, workspace. And we're going to be pursuing LEED's silver sort of uh, certifiable uh, 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 building code um, compliance. Next slide, please. As mentioned, uh, Bid 15, 15 Commonwealth uh, is uh, LLC is the um, uh, developer and affiliate of our companies. And finally, I would just note, next slide, please. Um, we are uh, an active uh, developer in the uh, greater Boston area. We've been in business here for over four decades. Uh, currently, um, we are building the Omni Seaport uh, Hotel, uh, just shy of the 1100 key hotel in the Boston Seaport District. Um, we are in construction on the East Boston waterfront with the Mark, which is a 107 unit condominium building. And we're under construction uh, in Boston South End with 100 Shawmut, which is a 138 unit rental condo. With that, I'll turn over to Eric Robinson from Murray Architects who will really brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. I thought it would be important just to start uh, quickly to um, summarize the, really the four goals of this project throughout its life in the public realm. Um, goal one was to design a building that was worthy of its historical site. Uh, goal two was to uh, design building that was consistent with its urban context. Three, uh, seeing a development project as a community benefit. And four, create a variety of home ownership opportunities and rental opportunities that uh, Michael and Stephen have already touched on. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, this is approximately a two acre site at the top of the hill on Commonwealth Avenue. It, Per, per our research, it appears to be the highest point in the city of Boston, actually. Um, and so, you know, that brings some significance with it, as well as its relationship to its, the historical nature of the site, um, which you'll see on the next slide is related to um, the quarrying that occurred on this site. So this is the old Rose Quarry site up on the hill, um, which really contributed Hi. to... Can everybody hear me? Sorry. Um, contributed to uh, the basis of construction for the city of Boston since it was such a high site. Um, it was easy to move material down the hill um, to the, the city at large. Next slide. The site itself falls on the, the border of two distinct urban districts. Um, and while we were doing our initial research, it was really evident that the space and the development across Commonwealth Avenue and Washington Street to our south is a smaller scale, edge to edge, street to street building of more three, four uh, story brick historical buildings. But the context that we are in is what we envision as more of uh, buildings in a, in, in a park. So buildings surrounded by an abundance of outdoor or landscaped areas. And so we wanted to make sure that we were uh, consistent with the, the urban neighborhood that we are building in. Next slide, please. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, there is some complexity to this site due to the topographic nature of the site. Um, some images of uh, the different perspectives from the street. So we're actually located on the carriage road of Commonwealth Avenue, which is you see in the upper right. And you can see how the grade ascends upward quite steeply along uh, the, the pathway. And then you can see as it, it levels off up at the top of the hill, uh, the existing building in the context on, in its context on the left hand slides. Um, it plateaus out up on top. Next slide, please. 
So when you look at this slide, we're proud to report it is about a two acre site, but we have approximately 54,000 square feet of green space on site. So we're able to retain a ton of outdoor space with 34,000 square feet of that site being publicly accessible along the street road, Western carriage road side, as well as creating a new public connecting point to Overlook Park on our northerly side. Next slide. So the, due to the complexity of the site, we were able to create an accessible path from the upper side or the left-hand side of the site, Washington Street, down the carriage road, through our site, under, under the overhang of our building, and then up the uh, northerly side um, to Overlook Park and create this accessibly from the top. Due to the topographic, we couldn't do it from below. However, we have created some public connection points along that route as well. And additionally, we're programming what we are calling the front yard to be an enhancement to the community at large. So this is all going to be public accessible and it'll have different areas of design that will create um, an outdoor flexible lawn space, some respite space along the sidewalk to really create a project that is enhancing the quality of its community space. Next slide. Here's just a rendering image of that connecting um, through our site to overlook uh, park beyond. So we're gonna enhance the quality of that with areas to, to sit and, and enjoy uh, that space as you connect through to the park. Next slide. And then just a snapshot of our some of our residential entry sequences. So this is the home ownership entry sequence. As you can see, it's really about a great connected um, space to the street and to the sidewalk beyond that feels very publicly accessible and open to the community at large. Next slide. And this is the rental entry to same character and openness and connectivity to um, the sidewalk and the public realm as well. Next slide. Just an overview sort of aerial as you can see the amount of landscaping that we have on the front of the building as it uh, ascends up and down uh, the, the existing topography of the site and really creating an amazing uh, front yard and landscape opportunity with the buildings nestled in, as we talked about earlier, buildings in a park. Next slide, please. Recently, we talked about building within the context of our uh, adjacent neighbors in our site. And as you can see, the building in the middle, as it utilizing some of the existing context as, as it's stepping up the pathway and the roadway. You can see we're just continuing that uh, notion. And then as we move up on top of the plateau, we're stepping back down toward some of the smaller buildings uh, that are arranged between us and Washington Street. A little bit of an enlarged view below. Next slide. And additionally, with the park being on the back side, this project really has no back. So we wanted to make sure that we're taking care of the building on all sides to ensure that the quality of the space that's on the front is also uh, equally important and as high quality on the back. Next slide, please. Back to Stephen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, and I'm just going to run very quickly through uh, the mitigation of community benefits uh, we're proposing with this project. At a high level, I would observe that um, it, uh, we take great pride in the package that's been put together. Uh, we work very closely with members of the community, with our IAG, with the BPDA, but in particular with, um, with the Boston Housing Authority uh, and with City Parks, um, two of our abutters uh, to the north. Um, and, and we think we've really found meaningful ways to create important value uh, for both those constituencies, which I'll run through in a moment. Um, as mentioned, this is currently an abandoned hospital site. That's actually a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, since March, the city of Boston has been utilizing the hospital uh, for COVID overflow treatment. And again, we're very proud to be able to serve the city in that way. Um, uh, as the IEP uh, units were laid out earlier, just a little more detail here. Um, we have 25 uh, units of ID of onsite IDP in our apartment component, representing 17% of the apartments. Uh, and we have 14 uh, condos on site, which again represents 14% there. 
In addition, um, the $600,000 offsite contribution uh, to the Alston Brighton CDC uh, is funding um, uh, much needed capital to uh, enable them to acquire and redevelop a project at Quinn Street, which is uh, going to provide 15, excuse me, 14 units of, of, sub, of uh, supportive housing people coming out of substance abuse treatment. Um, uh, the IDP ranges in the condos are between 80 and 100, and the rentals uh, start at 50 and, and range up to 120. Uh, again, I'm happy to have been able to accommodate a range of, of AMIs in this project. Um, in addition, as referenced earlier, uh, we're providing eight units of ours live workspace with affiliated uh, workspace. Um, uh, our most meaningful financial contribution is to the Boston Housing Authority and the Commonwealth Development, also known as Fidelis, which we have bought. Um, we're making a $300,000 contribution there, unrestricted for their use as they deem fit. Um, uh, I'm going to skip over the mobility study for a moment and touch upon the $120,000 uh, funding for youth services coordinator. Um, this is going to be somebody employed through the Oak Square YMCA providing services uh, to the residents of the Commonwealth Development um, community to ensure that uh, there's somebody there to really help uh, with youth and, and, and youth challenges in that community. In addition, we're making a $150,000 uh, contribution to the Austin Bright Mobility Study um, and a further uh, transit mitigation member, uh, measure will be providing $20 uh, per unit per month uh, for five years uh, for a shuttle service, which is an ongoing discussion amongst the various private development entities in the area. Um, uh, we are creating this new accessible pathway to Overlook Park, uh, which we abut. Um, again, as, as um, Eric provides some detail, this is uh, an accessible pathway. It's really kind of opening up the park to pedestrian access in ways that it doesn't uh, really currently enjoy. Um, and we're putting in some uh, a blue bike station and, and public bicycle racks. And then obviously uh, this will increase significantly the property taxes generated at the site and create 260 uh, roughly construction jobs and uh, 14 new permanent jobs as well. Yes. Uh, this is just a quick program overview. Um, the uh, max height of the building is going to be 90 feet. As you see, that is in the condominium side. Um, where you have 102 uh, units, um, and then we are at 70 feet in the apartment, uh, which is six stories, for its 151 uh, units there. And with that, I, I'd like to turn it over for question. Uh, if the board has any. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? I have one question. Um, you're talking about these as buildings inside the parks, and I appreciate all the great open space you have designed. Is that open space going to be permanently designated as open space? Uh, I'm going to defer to Rebecca Lee from Mince Levin, who's our attorney. She can speak to the particulars of that uh, a little better than, than I can. Um, it is going to be um, accessible to the public. Um, the portion that's going to be permanently um, encumbered is a pedest is the pedestrian path that you saw saw Eric outlined to you that is going to be an easement granted to the city acting through the Parks Commission so that there will always be a way for the public to get from um, from Commonwealth Avenue to Overlook Park. Um, the fact that it's open to the public is a condition of our approval. So it will be owned and operated as such. It'll be outlined in our cooperation agreement, for example. So that's kind of the straight path on the side, but the other. Well, part but it's of the also path? no, but but the it's the straight path to the side that comes up from Commonwealth, but it goes up a set of stairs, but the other portion of it comes in from the site drive sidewalk, that's the accessible portion that goes under the the overhang and and connects up. So there's sort of two routes that get you to that straight line to the park. All of that is considered part of the easement area that will be memorialized in a written agreement between us and the city acting through the Parks Commission. So it will, will be an adjunct of the park. And is, is the Parks Department taking care of that or are you all taking care of that for them? The land? Uh, uh, we, are owning, we are owning and maintaining the path and we're responsible for it. And we will be responsible to the city in the easement document for keeping it clear of snow and ice and litter and capital repairs and and the entirety great thank you for clarifying you're welcome okay no questions from the board 
All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Oh. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, item number 18. Request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving the requirement of further review pursuant to Article 80, Section 80B-5.3D of the Zoning Code for the construction of a mixed-use project consisting of 102 residential rental units, including 17 IDP rental units, 885 square feet of ground floor retail space, 62 garage parking spaces located at 44 through 46 Soldiers Field Place, formerly known as 1500 Soldiers Field Road, and to take all related actions. Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden, Michael Sinatra, Senior Project Manager, BPDA Development Review. The project before you is 44-46 Soldiers Field Place, formerly known as 1500 Soldiers Field Road in Brighton. The address was changed by inspectional services as of January 6th, 2021. The existing lot is a 26,000 square foot parcel. The proposal is to construct a 99,600 gross square foot six story building with 102 rental units, 17 of which will be IDP, which equates to 17 units. The parking will be made available for 62 vehicles or a ratio of 0.61. The height will be 69 feet, two inches and the FAR will be 3.83. Amenities include a pet relief area, a rooftop deck, as well as a small 885 square foot retail cafe. The proponent engaged in a very robust community process, which produced an excellent mitigation package, the details of which are outlined in the board memo. The development cost for the project will be $27 million. At this time, I would like to turn it over to the development team to run through their presentation in more detail, after which we would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, uh, Attorney Joe Hanley, McDermott, Quilty and Miller, uh, 28 State Street in Boston, representing the developer Stephen Ballas, who's on with us. I also have uh, Eric Howler from Howler and Yoon, who is the project architect. Um, I want to thank uh, the BPDA, uh, especially Mike Sinatra, Jonathan Greeley, and the folks from uh, Urban Design for helping us uh, through this process and leading to a project that has been supported now by both neighborhood groups and a majority of the IAG members uh, and is the result of uh, strong public review and uh, some real contributions at this location. 102 residential units, as Michael indicated, we are exceeding the requirements of the IDP by voluntarily providing 17% of affordability, which is four more than what would be required. Uh, we're also, as a result of this process, uh, we have introduced more three bedroom units and larger family sized units, which was the direct result of the input that we received. Um, this location is at the northern edge of Brighton uh, in an area that is a little bit disconnected. And so, as Michael indicated, we're making uh, some pretty significant investments in enhancing connectivity. Uh, to Boston Landing so that this can become more of a transit oriented uh, site and also stitch back into the community. And finally, we are um, introducing, this is a through lot um, that goes from Soldiers Field Road back to Soldiers Field Place. We're introducing an accessible public pathway that'll be open to the public to start to create really a new residential uh, community in this subsection of uh, the northern edge of Brighton. So with that, I would like to uh, ask Eric Howler to take you through the plans and presentation. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, this is a kind of view overall view of the project. It has a kind of distinctive stepped profile and plan. Uh, and that is a result of the kind of proximity to the river. If we go next, please. Uh, the site, as Joe mentioned, is sort of stuck between the Pike and the Charles. Uh, there's a kind of odd sliver of land there where the old Staples uh, was and the Acura dealership. Some of these industrial uses are converting to residential, and there's already a project under construction, 1550 Soldiers Field Road, uh, which introduces a bunch of residential um, uses 
within this kind of peninsula of Brighton. Uh, if we go next, please. So uh, the site is the yellow uh, rectangle. Uh, the H shown just to the left of that is a residential project that precedes this one. So it's the beginning of a neighborhood, which is quite exciting. Uh, you can imagine the yellow parcel has fantastic views of the Charles, but also great connectivity um, to Boston Landing, which is uh, a walk away. So uh, we are contributing to that. Next, please. really takes its form from the proximity to the river. We thought rather than create a kind of C shape or an H shape, we would do a kind of a prow shape. And so all the units, except for the ones facing directly south, have views of the Charles. And so the building is sculpted uh, to sort of accentuate that proximity to the river and give everyone a view. Uh, that was the primary sort of gesture for the project. Next, please. And when you see it in context, um, you can imagine how buildings adjacent to that might uh, take form as these warehouse uses convert to residential. Uh, but this building that we're developing, I think uh, Michael already shared the stats. It's about 102 units. Uh, we think that most of those will have views of the river. Um, and there's parking in one level of basement uh, below grade. Um, next, please. Um, the image on the left shows the context. The rendering shows the two arms of the H-shaped building. Our building is the silver one behind it. Uh, and the rendering on the right shows the kind of the nose of the building as it faces uh, the river. Uh, as you enter um, along this Soldiers Field Road, these three ends of the buildings will sort of set up a kind of rhythm. And it is a kind of gateway site uh, to, to, um, to the larger sort of Boston area. Next, please. Uh, the plan of the building on the ground floor, um, we have created a symmetrical building, but it's asymmetrically placed on the site. It's slightly to the to the right, uh, shifting uh, the public spaces to the to the left, which is the west side. Um, Joe alluded to this sort of through block connection that we're creating here. It is an accessible connection. It's eight foot six inches wide. Uh, it's slightly sloped, uh, and that is creating an outlet for this future neighborhood. Uh, to connect up to this path, uh, this new sidewalk, which is being proposed along Soldiers Field Road. So the building itself sort of uh, stands slightly to the right, allowing that connection to continue. Um, and its landscape is primarily uh, those two kind of wedge-shaped um, slivers on either side of the building. In terms of program, the main entrance is on Soldiers Field Place. The lobby is uh, fronting right onto Soldiers Field Place. Um, there is a retail in uh, light green in the bottom left-hand corner. It's understood as a restaurant or a cafe. Uh, there are community uh, uses, uh, gym, um, and then there's a, a lounge on the northern tip of the building. So we're trying to create uh, eyes on the street and activity on the corners, particularly the ones fronting this pathway so that it feels safe uh, coming home at night along that pathway. There are ground floor uh, residential uses in blue uh, and bike storage and orange. Next, please. Uh, some of the views of the project, uh, you see that uh, the kind of staggered uh, footprint uh, translates into a series of balconies where uh, most of the units get those views. Uh, the architectural expression is a kind of single material that's uh, shaped uh, to create those balconies uh, and to kind of accentuate the depth in the facade. The upper right-hand image shows that cafe on the corner. So that would be Soldiers Field Place. We imagine some activity on that corner accessible both from Soldiers Field Place and from that public pathway. The bottom right-hand image shows that pathway uh, showing some landscaping, seating areas, and some shade trees where possible. Next, please. Uh, a rendering, a rendered elevation rather, uh, section shows the level change. There's a, almost a six-foot level change from Soldiers Field Place to Soldiers Field Road. So this section is cut through that pathway, which is made accessible. Um, and it shows some of the elevations of the building uh, with the kind of tapered window surrounds, which amplify the kind of expression of the facade. Um, and um, I think what you don't see is there's a roof deck as well that would sort of have views over to the Charles. Um, and the, the primary connection is to that pathway, which is in the center of the screen. And it's, it's uh, dimensioned at five foot six inches. Next, please. So these show the four typical plans. The basement plan is the one level of parking below grade. 
with additional bike storage uh, and the 66 parking spots, 62 parking spots, excuse me. The ground floor plan, as we saw the typical plan, uh, you see the kind of uh, organization of the plan showing uh, the distribution of units. There are three bedroom units, as was alluded to in the bottom left-hand corner in purple. Uh, there are two bedroom units along the south face, a bunch of one bedrooms and studios in between. And I believe there's there are two bedroom units on the on the prow of the building as well. On the rooftop, we're showing the potential for solar panels facing south, kind of optimally uh, organized and a roof deck on the prow looking over the river. Next one, please. Okay, here, uh, here we do see the section through the whole project. You see the basement parking below, uh, the residential units um, in between and the roof deck with the views out to the river. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as was discussed, um, the connectivity back to Boston Landing is, is key. Uh, the dotted pink uh, lines <laughs> represent uh, uh, improvements, uh, connectivity improvements along Soldiers Field Road. Uh, this intersection is being redesigned, and I think this project is committed to improvements along Leo Birmingham Parkway. Uh, Joe, correct me if I'm saying anything wrong. We're also introducing some safe crosswalks at these areas. so. We're slowing the traffic down and also providing safe ways to cross. Next slide, please. In terms of the architecture, I mentioned we're using a single material uh, with a few different expressions. We are tapering uh, the windows surrounds to sort of accentuate those windows. Uh, some of these edges we're articulating as kind of knife edges. So when you look at it, you won't be quite sure what you're looking at. I think it's a, a quite an elegant uh, solution. Um, and some of the integration of the balconies uh, with some warm uh, wood accents uh, just to create some visual interest on the facade. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, and I believe this is our last slide. It shows um, the window pattern. We had looked at reducing the window sizes to become more energy efficient. That's still a work in progress, but this shows the four elevations. And I think we have one last slide, which I think is just our, our, our final rendering. Maybe we could advance to that during the Q&A. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Eric. And um, Madam Chair, that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Um, I do have one question. I know there were there were a quite of um, a few letters regarding kind of the uh, the parking ratios and, and things like that. Can you give some context to um, to that topic and, and kind of where um, where we settled on and, and why we think it's sufficient? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, for that. Um, so, you know, over a year process here, um, we had to strike a balance between um, folks asking us for, let's say, more parking and then I will say that our IAG was very, a little more progressive than some of the folks in the community that we heard for on the on the parking. We do recognize that um, in, in, you know, if you've been to this part of the city or this part of the neighborhood, it is still in, we are sort of building an edge condition within a neighborhood that isn't really walkable now. So uh, we thought that the better investments would be with, you know, those these pedestrian connectivities and, and the like. We did look at, at introducing a second layer of parking underneath, um, but there's, um, by virtue of where this is located, um, there's a limit as to how far you can go down before the water table becomes a major issue. Uh, and um, that just didn't, that also over parked the development. So where we ended up with, uh, we would suggest is Kind of a good balance we're also leaving enough space in the parking garage uh, as part of our support from the baia the brighton alston improvement association we agreed to leave enough space and to study how the parking works and if we had to add more we could accommodate stacks in the future and that'll be a part of our contract agreements with the bpda and ongoing discussions with the neighborhood okay. great thank you for that um, do we have any further questions from the board? All right, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. 
Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Beautiful project. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, item number 20. Wait, nope, nope. Item number 19. Request authorization to issue a cert certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 23 income-restricted family-sized apartments, including an on-site office located at 37 Wales Street to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for zoning relief and to take all related action. Uh, Michael. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden, Michael Sinatra, Senior Project Manager, BPDA Development Review. The, pro the proposal before you is 37 Whale Street in Mattapan. The address is technically in Dorchester, but it falls under Mattapan zoning. The current site is a 10,000 square foot parcel currently occupied by a three-story brick building with 10 apartments. It was acquired by the proponent Heading Home Inc. in 2011 to provide supportive housing for homeless families. Structural issues have forced the proponent to vacate the building and demo it. The proposal is to demolish the building and construct a new five-story, 25-family-sized unit building comprised of two bedrooms and three bedrooms to continue Heading Home's mission of supportive housing. The proposal will also include amenity space and on-site office space for Heading Home staff. All units will be targeted to formerly homeless families with incomes at or below 30% AMI. The existing building is not deed restricted, but the proposed project will remain deed restricted as affordable housing in perpetuity as a condition of city D&D funding, which the proponent will be seeking in order for the project to move forward and be successful. The proponent will enter into a mass docks affordable housing restriction, which will allow the units to remain restricted in perpetuity. There will be no parking associated with the project with the exception of one tandem parking spot for staff only. However, there will be 23 bike parking spots, a one-to-one -one ratio for the residents' use. The project is exempt from the IDP requirement due to 100% of the units being low income affordable at 30% AMI. And then just one last quick note, included in your board packet are letters of support from city councilors Andrea Campbell and Anissa Asabi george as well as a support letter from State Representative Russell Holmes. At this time, I would like to turn it over to the development team to run through their presentation in more detail, after which we would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Danielle Ferrier. I am the CEO of Heading Home. Heading Home was founded in 1974, um, and our mission is to end homelessness in Boston and Greater Boston. We are the largest and most comprehensive provider of shelter, transitional, and permanent housing and supportive services for both fami families and individuals. Our commitment is to help extremely low income households and those with the most complex needs. Currently, we own and manage over 200 apartments in Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury neighborhoods. For the last 15 years, more than 90% of our, for our formerly homeless families have remained permanently housed. Heading Home acquired 37 Wales in 2011, so we have been part of this neighborhood for 10 years. During this time, we have provided permanent supportive housing with services for 10 families with minimal turnover. We made the difficult decision to vacate the building in January of 2020 due to structural concerns and all families were relo relocated to new housing. Our goals for the redevelopment are to maintain and expand supportive housing program at the site, to continue to serve the city's most vulnerable families, those who are extremely low income and formerly homeless, to create scale and efficiencies to support on-site staffing and sustainable operations, to provide a permanent solution for building and site structural issues that cause us to vacate the existing building. The project will be financed with funding from city and the state. Supportive housing is a high priority for both and we've been working closely with DND on plans for the project. We've had multiple meetings with the Butters and other neighborhood stakeholders over the past six months as we've moved through the design project. Next slide, please. We will create 23 affordable housing units for formerly homeless families. 29 construction jobs and one permanent job on site. At this point, I would like to turn the rest of our presentation over to Gail. Thanks, Danielle. Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for having us. So as Danielle mentioned, we have 23 bikes. Michael mentioned it as well. I also want to note there are five plus parks and recreation facilities nearby. No mention that a little more later. Let's go to the next, Michael. Thank you. So 37 Whale Street, for people who don't know it, Whale Street runs from Blue Hill Avenue, uh, where it hits Franklin Park, 
to Harvard Street. We're very near the corner of Blue Hill and Talbot to give you an idea of the neighborhood. The next. This shows that neighborhood. It is a great place for families. There is, as I mentioned, there are both Franklin Park and Harambee Park. There's retail nearby, there's school, there's childcare, there's a health center, there's public transit. So it's a really terrific location for this use. Next. And I wanna mention a couple of things about the context. So there is a almost 60 foot grade change from Blue Hill Avenue, which you see in the distance here, the green trees. This is looking up toward Blue Hill down to Harvard Street. So this one block is a very steep street. This photograph on the left gives you a little bit of an idea. The other thing that's notable about this neighborhood is the incredible range of typologies and you see a fair amount of it here. There are a number of uh, turn of the 20th century uh, brick apartment buildings, three story on the left, four story uh, in a number of locations that you see on the top right. Salvation Army runs a childcare center that has an open public park playground uh, right on the street. Next one, looking down toward Harvard Street, you really get a feel for the slope here. And on the left, you see a bit of the playground and park by Salvation Army. On the right, noticeably, three apartment buildings creating a very strong street wall immediately adjacent to Heading Homes property. Let's go to the next. And this shows you the property and it's a pretty tired building. There are a number of issues with this building. Uh, so, but one of the things I wanna note about it, a couple of things about the site. One is obvious, there's quite a slope along the front property line, six feet from one corner to the other. What you can't see fully here is there's also a natural grade change of an average of 12 feet from the front of the property to the back of the property. When they built this building, which was an infill building, there are a number of them in the neighborhood, they built it up on about 12 feet of fill. So there's a very sizable uh, retaining wall at the back facing the rear of butters. And one of the problems that Heading Home has had is that those, it has retaining walls on two sides and they have been failing for quite a while. So one of the things that we've been working with the neighbors on is to figure out how to reduce those. And I'll get to that as I show you the design. Let's go on. So a few things, 23 units, all affordable. There's four three bedroom, 19 two bedroom units in a 26,000 square foot building. So our FAR is 2.6. That's one of our zoning variance requests. Height is another. Uh, there are a few others like parking. Uh, Michael mentioned one parking space, but storage for 23 bikes. Let's go on. I did want to mention, I saw other people had the sustainability category on their intro slides and we didn't have that when we had an old one, but sustainability is an important part of this project. We are uh, one of the first projects coming in under D&D's new guidelines, which is zero carbon, all electric building. I want to remind you it's 100% affordable, deeply affordable housing, but we are meeting the all electric requirement. We are also pursuing possibly Passive house certification. We're looking at it right now with Mass Save. It will be a climate resilient building and will meet LEED Silver version four. So we have very high aspirations in terms of the sustainable development here. Uh, we'll also design it to be ready for solar electric photovoltaic panels on the roof. So let's move on to the site plan. So here you see there's not a lot of site that's unbuilt. Uh, it's a very tight site for all that we're trying to do on it. In recognition of the fact that to the left are the wood frame buildings, the immediately adjacent one is a relatively small two and a half story building and then there are triple deckers and the right the larger apartment building. So, sorry. We pulled further away from the building on the left. We're 17 feet from the property line there. It, this scheme is old. It shows tandem parking. There's actually only one space. We're intensely landscaping this site. So I mentioned reducing the height of the retaining walls. The maximum retaining wall height will be eight feet toward the rear, toward the Abbott Street neighbors. And we hope to reduce it even further at, on the side, on the left side, the lot there. 
to create a better relationship right now this property towers over its neighbors and we really want to integrate it better into the neighborhood the other thing that we're looking to do is to create some outdoor space for the families who will live here and we're doing that in a few ways one in the front you see a small entry patio this will be pretty privatized by a planting bed at the front the, even the parking is going to double duty as play space potentially. And then at the rear, we have a series. We have a walkway and a series of three patios separated by landscaping with the idea that families ought to be able to gather outside, but not necessarily all together. So multiple families can be outside at the same time. So we have some pretty high aspirations in terms of the landscape as well. Keep going. The view showing a little bit up Whale Street. Here you see our building uh, next to the first adjacent brick building. This is one of three in a row. And we're really trying to be contextual. We understand we're a lot higher than the building to the left, but contextual with the variety of buildings that you see here. And one way we're doing that is making an alignment with the limestone uh, detail at the apartment building at the right. So we can't set the fifth floor back and get the number of units. There will be a detail there. We're considering a change of material at the fifth floor. So there's a little sense of that receding in recognition of the four-story buildings to the right. We will do brick at least at the first floor. We're still in conversations with BPDA and D&D about exactly what will be brick. What isn't brick will be a high quality fiber cement panel. Go on to the next. And this shows the street view looking down toward Harvard. One of the things that we think is really important is an alignment of the street wall with the adjacent buildings, which we've done. Because the other side of the street, as you can see even in this image, is extremely varied. Buildings step back and forward. Some of them are higher than the sidewalk by quite a bit. Let's go to the next. And then that's, I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them, but just the summary here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the board? I'd like a little information on the uh, reactions that you're um, getting from the neighbors. Danielle, you want to talk about that? Um, sure. So we've been working closely with the neighbors since the start of this. Um, this site has been a, a harder site for some of the neighbors, um, given how it was built many years ago. And so we have been working with them to understand what their needs are and to try to re redevelop it with a building that, um, you know, helps really uh, build up the neighborhood and works for the neighbors. So when Gail is discussing um, things like the grades along the side in our adjacent neighbors, um, those are big um, important areas for them that they have talked about um, based on what historically had happened. And so um, we have been very in, in very close contact with our neighbors to make sure that we hear them and we're working with them um, you know, as best as we can to accommodate their asks. Perhaps most importantly, the immediately adjacent to the left neighbor who presumably is most impacted has been favorable to the project. So we're looking to alleviate problems that they've lived with for quite a while around stormwater and the, the cracking retaining walls, which threaten a couple of garages. It's a very important project. And I think that particularly in terms of your uh, sustainability um, aspects um, and of course the, the population you're serving it's it's the kind of project we we wish we could see more of frankly um, a lot more of um, so I, I uh, commend you for the um, courage that it takes to move forward with this and and the caring that you're showing um, both for the families who will be residents and and for uh, the neighborhood as a whole. And I would encourage you, but I'm sure that uh, this may be uh, unnecessary to continue to work with the neighbors on uh, the, the um, potential impacts um, and the ways in which uh, this kind of development will serve the wider community. 
Thank you. We are very conscientious and, and really want this to be a building that the neighborhood um, embraces and, and works for them as well. Just a comment. Um, I'm sure you, you've looked at this through so many different, uh, under so many different ways, but it seems to be a, a lot of families, a lot of people in there with not a lot of open space. So I understand the more uh, homeless families, or homeless people that we can help, the better off we are, but also trying to balance that with so many people in this building to have the appropriate open space. Just a comment, I don't know what the right solution is or what the right number and um, what the right balance is, but I'd just like to point that out. I commend you for your efforts and I hope you're successful with your your plan on uh, ending homelessness uh, in the region. So best wishes with the project. Thanks. If I could just say a little, I mean, I, I glossed over it because I was trying to make sure we stayed in time, but uh, one of our thoughts about that was to make sure that there wasn't just a single place for people to go outside. And so Ground Inc. is our landscape architect. They're very thoughtful. And we've got these three different patios. They're each surrounded by some planting. So there's a sense of you can go out there as if it was your private home to a small area. It's not big, but there'll be barbecues. There'll be some sitting area. There'll be some place for the children to hang out some biking area on the walkway. And there is a playground immediately across the street or diagonally across the street at Salvation Army. And also another playground, what is that? Four houses down on Harvard Street. So there are two immediately accessible playgrounds for younger kids, older kids. There's Harambe Park, which has great recreational resources. Thank you. Uh, additional questions from the board? Madam Chair, I have um, kind of a question and a comment. I'm not sure if Gail or Danielle best suited to uh, to answer it. So I was curious, where did the all electric uh, decision come from? Where was where was that from? It's actually now in D&D's guidelines as of August 10th of 2020, that any building that D&D funds and it's to be consistent with the city's carbon neutral by 2050 plan. So anything that the city is funding at this point needs to meet an all electric uh, requirement. So I think by what year, by, by 2050? That, well, that's the city's overall plan for carbon neutrality by 2050. Okay, I'm, I'm an electrician. So if anybody would like the decision it would be me, right? But you and I have had the conversation before yeah. about photovoltaic panels. Yep, in uh, in Ted mentioned, you know, the term the population you're serving. Okay. So this population doesn't need any additional expenses shifted onto that onto them. And this is it's more expensive for all electric than it is to have gas. And um, yep. and with uh, the amount of units, it's not doing much for the carbon footprint. Seeing that the electricity that they will be using because they don't have gas, is coming from power plants that are powered by gas, or in part are coming from a fuel mix of, it could be even trash, and, or wood. And wood is, wood is more damaging to the environment than coal on electricity that's generated by wood. So there's a lot of people I don't think they really understand the fuel mix, the, how they get their electricity. And sometimes you're getting your electricity from a dirtier source for cooking and heating than if you just had gas, you know? But uh, that's just my comment, I guess, and my question, so thank you. And what I will say is we are hoping through one means or another, either through grant or through a power purchase agreement to have photovoltaics on the roof, which would then offset the expense. So, but you're right, we <clears throat> live in a transitional moment and again, I enjoy the luxury of installing solar panels for my trade, right? <laughs> so, um, but people, solar power is like square wheels. I mean, I think the, what's all the roof, the roof's about, what, 10,000 square feet? Because the land, the land square feet's 10,000. You have to have some open space, not as much, so as Brian pointed out. So you have to divide that 10,000 by 17 point square, 17.6 square feet. That's what a solar panel is. So whatever the answer is, is how many solar panels you will be able to get max. 
times that number by about 400 watts for six hours a day. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you're, you're not, you wouldn't, every unit wouldn't even be able to run a hairdryer based on what it is. But again, it's, the public doesn't really understand. Um, it all sounds good. Solar power and wind power is really tax shelters for hedge funds. That's really what it is, but people don't understand really what is going on. But solar panels are like square wheels in the Northeast. But anyway, that's my, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thanks so much. Period of transition. <laughs> Great. Um, additional questions or comments from the board? Right. Well, as a new um, as a new resident uh, to this Mattapan Lower Mills Dorchester area, um, I'm super uh, proud of this project. I think it's a really great opportunity uh, for for our neighborhood um, and um, and to create a, a place where um, where you know we're all we're all welcome and we can. Um, yeah, just, it, it's a really great neighborhood. Like you said, there's a lot of really fabulous amenities and, a, you know, a great place for families. So I'm very excited for this to kind of be a yes in my backyard situation. So um, great job. And um, with that, uh, I think a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, item number 20. Oh, wait, what are, how are we doing on time? Teresa, uh, Secretary Paul Humus will do another one and then we'll move to public hearing? Or do we want to take a break? Uh, let's take a break right now and come back right at 5.30 and start the public hearing. Okay, that sounds good. All right, uh, so we'll take a break and resume at 5.30 for the public hearing um, agenda item number 26. See you soon.